Let's begin our study here in the book of uh, Job. We're looking at chapter 37. We'll begin at verse 1. I'll read to verse um, 4, and we'll get into our study. Job chapter 37, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. He sends it forth under the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. And so again, let me give to you just a, a review, because we're picking up in a speech that a young man named Aliu is, uh, is giving, and, and <laughs> so I'll begin, and that cough I just gave is not COVID. Uh, so I see people putting their masks on. You don't have to do that. I have allergies. Anyway, as we've seen, uh, Job is uh, actually being spoken to, lectured to, if you will, uh, by a younger man, a man that is named Eliu. And Eliu has been admonishing Job because Eliu believes, as we have seen, that Job has misjudged God. He also believes that Job's friends have not made good arguments to convince Job as to how he has misjudged God. He has said that Job has complained that God has treated him unfairly. And because of this, Elihu argued that God is righteous and God is to be trusted. He said God is mighty and he doesn't use his power to oppress those who are weak. And that's because, according to chapter 36, verse 5, that's because his strength is guided, he says, by his wisdom. He also had said God is compassionate. And when God uses his power, when he exercises his power, he does so to help those in need. He said in chapter 36, verse 6, that God gives justice to the oppressed. And so God is compassionate. God is powerful, but he doesn't oppress. And the psalmist said in Psalm 22, verse 24, he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. And that's basically what Eliu is saying here, that God doesn't oppress. He listens to the cries for help. He went on and continued in his speech by warning Job concerning hypocrites. He said they don't cry for help because they don't trust God, and because they don't trust God, they end up suffering. On the other hand, God would have delivered you, Job, if you would have cried out. Job, you would have been restored, he said, had you accepted your afflictions and had you learned from them. He would have taken you out of the cramped place that you're in. He'd have put, in you, put you into an open place. And then he closed the speech in chapter 36 by, by reminding him once again of how powerful God is. When you look at uh, the verses all the way from verse 22 to the conclusion at verse 33, He's pointing out a few things. I'll use some of the things he said to build into the introduction. He had said, God is awesome, and we're not capable of fully understanding him. As long as we're in the flesh, we cannot hope to completely fathom the Lord. Again, notice in verse, 30, uh, verse 26 in chapter 36, notice how he said this. Elihu said, behold, God is great, and we do not know him, nor can the number of his years be discovered. I want to read that again and develop it just for a moment as an introduction to chapter 37. Again, notice verse 26, God is great. We do not know him. That's an interesting thing to say. Elihu is saying that God is unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. And in making that statement, obviously he's correct. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, God says it. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And Paul made that statement in Romans 11, verse 33, when he said, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 
And so when he says God is great, we do not know him. With that, much of Scripture agrees. That's something that we've already seen, by the way, stated by one of his friends, Zophar. You remember him? Zophar said something similar in chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. He had said, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And so on the one hand, he says, God is great. We do not know him. And part of the reason from just from the theological perspective, obviously, um, our sin has separated us from our God. And because of our sin, we don't seek him. There's none that seeketh after him. Romans chapter three tells us. And because of this, God has given us evidence of his existence. And, and there are witnesses that, that we can look to and, and we can see, which can actually speak to us. Now, I've given you this before. I'm just running over this and adding a couple, two or three things to it. But God has given us evidences of his existence. He's given to us what is called conscience. Now, conscience is, is not the Holy Spirit. Conscience is what has been called a moral barometer. Conscience is uh, there to, to inform us when we've done right and when we've done wrong. The problem with our conscience is sometimes it gives us permission to do that which is wrong. And sometimes we should feel bad, but we don't because we have a hardened conscience. But God has given to us a conscience because it does help us to know there is a right and there is a wrong. Paul made mention of this in the book of Romans in chapter 1, verse 19, when he said, what may be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown it to them. When he said, what may be known of God is manifest, the word manifest is a word that means imprinted. It's imprinted upon their consciences. God has imprinted this on their conscience. They have a conscience. They're able to know that it's right. They're able to know that it's wrong. Your conscience can either accuse you or it can excuse you, but it can't save you because it takes the Holy Spirit to awaken you to your sin, but your conscience can accuse you. So we have a conscience. We also have the witness of creation. Romans 1 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of that in just a moment as he points to nature. God has given prophets. Sometimes we forget about that. But in the Old Testament, as well as the New, God gave prophets, those who spoke forth the mind of God, those who would speak prophetically concerning future events, but a prophet would also speak concerning the events surrounding them at that time and speak forth the mind of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, uh, it, it reads, God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. So there's conscience, there's creation, there's the prophets, there's the scriptures. In John 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So there's the witness of scripture. And there's also, obviously, the witness of the Spirit. Because in John 16, verse 8, when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so, even though we do not know him in our own natural power, intellect, or ability, God has made it possible by dropping, if you will, breadcrumbs for us to follow so that he can open himself to us through the scriptures and the ultimate witness of God, Jesus himself. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. The ultimate witness is Jesus. So Elihu here is making it clear that God is great and man cannot know him unaided. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said it like this. He said, all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son 
and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And so Alihu's making it clear that man can't know God unaided. He's too great. And that's why all of this leads to one person, Jesus Christ. That's why we need Jesus. When he was speaking to one of his disciples, he says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen God in human flesh, Jesus was saying to his disciple. And so as we've been looking through chapter 36 and moving into chapter uh, 37, we've seen how Elihu has been laying out an argument. And in verses 27 through 33 here in chapter 36, he concluded with words concerning the wonders that God performs. And as we looked through those verses last time, Elihu pointed out that God gives rain, God has created clouds, that God brings forth thunder, and God brings forth lightning. And he can use the rain, he can judge by withholding it, or he can bless by providing it. And as he was sharing that, he concluded the chapter by saying that the cattle are frightened by lightning. And he says, and I've had the same, the same response. Because in verse 37 of chapter 36 and moving into verse 1 of chapter 37, he said his thunder declares it, the cattle also concerning the rising storm. The cattle are aware of the, of the lightning, the thunder, and all of that. And it, it causes them to be a little bit afraid. But he goes on in verse 1 of chapter 37 and says, At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. When nature exhibits its power, it sends chills up my spine. And somebody says, oh, that sounds kind of backwards, doesn't it? I mean, uh, really? I'd say, yeah. Um, I'd say even to this day. You say, I don't think so. I say, you liar. No, I say, yeah. <laughs> of course. Have you ever been startled by lightning and thunder? Sure. How do you feel when an earthquake hits? Do you kind of sit there saying, this is cool? <laughs> no, you don't. You know, I've taught more than once in this church, in this church, when we've had an earthquake hit while I was teaching. I thought it was the power of the Spirit, but no, it was an earthquake. <laughs> and I have seen people literally stand up and run out of the church, and not just because they don't like me, <laughs> because of the fear. I've seen it more than once. And, I, and in the sanctuary over there, our main sanctuary, that sanctuary platform is, is actually, if you were here to see years ago when we built that sanctuary, you would know that there's a pile of dirt that's real thick and compact. So that platform that you're looking at is actually built on dirt that's been packed down, and then they poured a thin layer of concrete over it. And so I've been there when earthquakes have hit, and I don't feel it. I don't feel it but I've seen the eyes of the people as I'm teaching. And they get all big like that. And I say, man, that was a good point, Jesus. But no, it was an earthquake. It was an earthquake. And I knew it because they were, and I turned and I looked at the screen and the cameras were moving. That's how big the earthquake was. So, so yeah, nature has a way of startling you into the reality of how small you are in comparison to how great nature in and of itself actually is. So the, th the sound of thunder and, 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 and the lightning, all of that can be seen and heard for miles. And when nature exhibits its power, he's saying it, it sends chills up my, my spine. Now, he's not saying that thunder is God's voice. It could seem like he is, no. What he's saying is when God speaks, man must hear his voice. So he says in verse 2, hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Pay attention. When he says hear attentively, pay attention. Pay attention, he's saying, to the Lord. Hear what he's saying. Pay attention. When my children were very small and I would be speaking to them, and I'm speaking about when they were three and four years old, I would... Uh, Sometimes be talking to them and sharing something that I thought they should know even at that age. And sometimes kids will just, your kids, if you're a parent, you know this. Uh, they would kind of look around while I was talking, you know. They would do that. I'd say, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they'd be looking at me like, like that. 
And, 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 and what I would do on occasion, not all the time, is I'd, no, I would, <laughs> I would, I would put my hands on their little faces. I, they were just little babies. And I'd redirect their gaze. And I'd say, just one moment, daddy's telling you something. You need to hear this. That's what I did with them. I would hold their little face. I'd say, just one moment, daddy's telling you something to train them to listen and to pay attention. Well, he's saying, hear attentively, Job. Pay attention. Pay attention to what God is saying. I wonder how many times the Lord has had to grab my face and redirect my gaze because I'm looking around kind of like the Apostle Peter. He's doing something he shouldn't do. He's walking on water, and he's looking around where his attention shouldn't be, which is the waves, and he's hearing the sounds of the wind and all in and Jesus calls his attention back. Pay attention. So he's saying, what is the Lord saying? Listen carefully, because when God speaks, listen. Now, what is he saying? Well, in Isaiah 45, 22, the Lord says, look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no other. And Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Pay attention. He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. So we listen to what the Lord has to say. He says, listen to me, come to me, look to me, be saved. I will give you rest. And so hear attentively the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Verse 3, he sends it forth under the whole heaven, his lightning to the ends of the earth. And so thunder rolls and Lightning flashes, and it can be heard and seen for miles. Well, even so, the voice of the Lord, he's saying, goes forth. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. If you take notes, Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Even as he's speaking concerning the lightning and the thunder and the creation of God, they're given a witness to the one that we should come to. He says in verse 4, after it, a voice roars as he thunders with his majestic voice and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. After the lightning flash, you have that thunderclap. So by saying he doesn't restrain them, it may simply be speaking of the rain that he's been speaking of prior to that. He doesn't restrain the rain. In verse 5, he says, God thunders marvelously with his voice. He says he does great things which we cannot comprehend. Well, thunder is a way of understanding the volume and the majesty of God's voice. So he uses that as a picture but he says in verse 5, he does great things which we cannot comprehend. Psalm 92, verse 5, O Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. Isaiah 55, 8, again, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And so he does great things that we can't, in the natural, we can't understand. He says in verse 6, for he says to the snow, fall on the earth. Likewise, to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He says to the snow beyond the earth, fall on the earth. He's the one, he is the God who controls nature. And in controlling nature, he's saying he exhibits his, his strength. Again, in Psalm 107, verse 29, it says he calms the storm so that the waves are still. That reminds me of something we read in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to verse 27, we read about Jesus. And I mentioned something of this a moment ago. He got into a boat. His disciples followed him. Suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. His disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us. We're perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. 
So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So he's using as an illustration the authority and power of God and how nature is even at his control. He says to the snow, this is where you go, etc. And that reminds me of Jesus. That reminds me of his power to the point where, and I find this interesting, that he had been ministering to his men for some time by the time Matthew records this. They had gotten to know him uh, a bit. He had done marvelous things already. They were there, for example, when the first miracle was recorded, how he turned water into wine in, in Cana of Galilee. They were aware of the things he could do. They'd seen him do works already. But man, there you are, and these are seasoned sailors and all, and there you are on uh, in a storm, and, and they know that, uh, that the storms can destroy you. When you go to Israel and you're on the Sea of Galilee, it's called the Sea of Galilee, though it's not a salt water, it's, a, it's fresh water, but you know, when you go on the Sea of Galilee, uh, you'll see this. It's, it's called the Sea because it's so huge. It's very large, eight or nine miles from north to south, a few miles from the east to the west. It's a good-sized lake. And so the, the wind would come, and it would, uh, warm wind would be coming from the east, and the cool wind would be coming from the west. And you'll see something, it will, will, if you go with us, you'll see this, it's called the Arbel. And it's a, an opening in a small hillside, or actually a small mountain site. And the wind comes in through that Arbel, through that pass, and the cold and the warm air will hit. Will, and, and when they hit, they create storms. And we've been on the Sea of Galilee during one of those small storms, not a big one, but a, sn a small storm. We've been on that. And John was asleep at the back of the boat. And I said, John, get up. We're going to perish. Don't you care? But he was busy eating. And so I'm sorry, John. I'm here sitting right that time. I have to. But can you imagine that? These are seasoned sailors. They grew up, you know, working on this particular, in this particular profession. And they know that this intense storm can swamp their, their small boat and they can all die. And, and when, you know, we, we have a lot of faith until it's tested. And then we discover where it really is. I think I shared this with you before. I know I have, perhaps it. It hasn't been recent enough for me to feel bad about repeating this. But we were coming home from a trip, and as we were coming from approaching the, um, we were coming from the uh, east going west, and we were approaching New York. And we were going to be um, landing in New York. And as we were coming, the airplane it was a 747, and those of you who travel know that's a huge airplane. That's a huge airplane. And as we're traveling, we hit a storm off the East Coast, huge storm. And the, uh, the airplane began to go down and then come back up. And it was very sudden. And it was doing that a lot. And it was so bad that the masks that they tell you, you know, in case of the, the cabin uh, losing pressure, these masks will fall. They were falling all over the place. And so... It was so bad, we were on Al Al Airline, and you need to know something. If you've traveled to Israel, you know this, but the Orthodox Jews don't necessarily want anything to do with Christians. They just don't. Um, not this time. The Orthodox, the Orthodox Jews, because you're on Al Al, it's a Jewish airline, actually came to us and said, please come and join us in prayer. And so a lot of our, our people went to the back, and they were praying with these Orthodox Jews and everything, and, and I'm telling you, it was pretty, it was heavy. I mean, it, 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 until you've been in a huge airplane just dropping and then coming back up, you haven't lived. It's a lot better than, <laughs> it's a lot, of better, a lot better than Magic Mountain, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and as we're, as we're traveling, this was happening. And um, I mean, this is how bad it was. My daughter, Corinne, who was 15, I turned around and she was singing praise songs. She never did that at 15, but she... <laughs> But I was sitting reading a newspaper. And later on, I told you this before, I'm sure, my daughter 
Corinne, we landed obviously safely, here I am. But my daughter Corinne said, Daddy, why weren't you afraid? And I said, because I know that God isn't through using me in our church. God isn't through with the church. And she looks at me, she says, did it ever occur to you? He doesn't need you to finish the work he wants to do in the church. And I said, you know, good point. Glad you didn't mention that while I was reading the paper. But later on, as a matter of fact, this happened just last year. And this has been many years. My, my daughter, Corinne, is 43. So this is 28 years ago. So my daughter, Anna, just last year was speaking to me. And she said, Dad, you remember? And she brought that story up. She said, you remember the plane was going up and down and the masks were falling and people were crying? There were women crying and yelling. It was really quite a scene. I said, yes, of course. She said, you know what? I wasn't afraid. I'd never asked her. She says, I wasn't afraid, Daddy. And I said, really? And why is that? She said, because I kept my eye on you. She said, if you got afraid, I would get afraid. You were not afraid. Your peace was a peace that I could borrow from. And I've never forgotten that. Because Christians, the peace that God gives you that passes understanding that the world doesn't know is a witness to those who are in fear. Be aware of that. Be aware of that. Because God can use the peace he gives you in the midst of all of this. And so with the Lord, Jesus was there. He calms the storm because he has control over it. And it causes the question, as I mentioned a moment ago as I was reading, that his own men had said, who can this be? That even the winds and the sea obey him. He's the God of nature, and this is not an ordinary man. In verse 7, it says, he seals the hand of every man that all men may know his work. He seals the hand of every man. In other words, all normal outside activity ceases. It ceases when... The weather changes when God brings the snow or, or rain. He's saying man must bow to the God who controls the weather. He seals the hand of every man that all men may know his work. In verse 8, the beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. Even animals react to weather changes. They take cover in bad weather. In verses 9 and 10, he continues and he says, From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God, ice is given. And so warm air comes from the south and is causing these whirlwinds, and cold air comes from the north. Verse 11, also with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds. They swirl about being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them. On the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. So he's he's saying that, uh, that God uses the rain, the moisture. Uh, he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters the bright clouds, and he uses rain. He can use rain in various ways. And he points to three. God can use rain for correction. Uh, that means that he can bring floods. And we look back in the Bible and we say, yes, he did, including that great flood. He can also use rain, he said, for his land. Now, rain for his land is, is obviously normal irrigation. Crops can be grown because God causes the rain to fall. And, and there are times that God uh, shows his mercy by bringing rain, especially in, in times of drought. Again, I, I mentioned to you that in the history of Israel, in the history of Israel, uh, God had allowed them to be in Egyptian bondage for hundreds of years. And then ultimately, God was bringing them to the land of promise that he had given to them. And, uh, and God said this, and I'm paraphrasing. He said, the land that I'm bringing you to is not like the land of Egypt. Because the land of Egypt has the mighty Nile River. The mighty, mighty Nile River is the river that they use for irrigation, drinking, and, and all their water needs. It's a huge and a mighty, mighty river, he says. But Israel doesn't have a mighty river. Israel has the Jordan. The word Jordan, it, it simply means descending from Dan. That's what Jordan means. 
It's descended from Dan because Dan was the northernmost tribe in Israel. And up in Dan, they have uh, three, three uh, tributaries that combine into the Jordan River. So there are three small tributaries we go to. Actually, we see all three of those tributaries when we go to, uh, to Israel. And then you'll see the Jordan River, and, and it is so small in some areas that you could almost jump over it, just leap across it. That's how small it is, but it, it drains into the Sea of Galilee. And so God said, you're not going to be able to rely on the Jordan River because it isn't a, it's not enough water to produce irrigation and drinking needs for all of you. It's not going to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring what is called the, latter, the early and the latter rains. He said, so you're going to rely on me to provide for you water. So when the water comes, you'll know who provided it for you. You're not going to rely on the Nile the way you did in Egypt. You now need to rely on me in the land of promise. And the water that comes, the rain that comes, is a symbol of my grace so that I pour my rain. And Jesus said that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. It's a general grace that God gives. And so God controls the water. He goes on in verse 14. Listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Now, we're getting to a point where Elihu is ending. He's ending his speech, and he's making what would be called a personal appeal to Job. Now, he's already made statements similar to this in chapter 33. In verse 5, he said, If you can answer me, set your words in order before me. Take your stand. And in chapter 33, verses 31 through 33, he said, Give ear, Job. Listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. I still think that's very arrogant. But he's saying, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God as I have just explained them to you. Verse 15, he says, do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? Why are your garments hot when he quiets the earth by the south wind? With him, have you spread out the skies strong as a cast metal mirror? And so basically, he's asking questions, hoping to reveal Job's ignorance concerning the works of God. Can you answer these questions, Job, concerning physical realities? Well, if you can't, then how can you know the works of God? So he says in verse 15, do you know how God arranges and governs the wind, clouds, cold, snow and the heat in verse 18 did you help god to create the sky like a canopy burning brightly by the sun can you answer me concerning the natural world job that's what he's doing here doesn't that remind you of a conversation jesus had with a man named nicodemus nick at night remember how he had come to jesus by night that'll take a moment yeah, the Bible speaks to us concerning a man, of the, uh, a leader of the Jews, his name was Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night and began to speak to him. He said, Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do the works that thou doest unless God be with him. And so he initiated a conversation. He's mentioning that he's been observing him. Not only that, that he's representing others who have observed him. Nicodemus was a teacher of the Jews. Jesus said, are you a teacher of the Jews? And when he spoke to him and said that to him, he was saying, are you not the leading teacher of the Jews? Are you not well known? And are you not well versed? And so he had this conversation with Jesus concerning spiritual things. We don't know why Nic Nicodemus came by night, but he did. Perhaps he felt that that would be the best time for him to speak without interruption. So in the conversation Jesus begins to speak to him concerning spiritual things. He speaks concerning uh, the wind. And, and he says in, in John chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. <laughs> How can this be, Nicodemus asked. 
You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? You can't understand the natural, and yet you think you can understand the supernatural. The things of God are so deep, who can fathom them? They're so high, who can reach them? Unless God determines to reveal these things to us, they remain a secret. And so, Job, you can't even answer the simple things concerning nature itself. Again, reminding me of the conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus had. If we think that we can learn and search and find, we fail to realize that even as Isaiah said, truly thou art a God that hidest thyself. You can't by searching find him. This upcoming Sunday, I'll be developing that in, in much more detail as we go through our Revelation study. But you, uh, you cannot by searching find him. He isn't lost. You know, a lot of times I've heard the testimony. Some of you have too. And I used to say this when I was first saved. I used to say I was this, 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 this. And then I found God until finally I realized he wasn't lost. I didn't find him. It wasn't like he was hiding somewhere in a corner playing cosmic hide and seek. And now I found you, you know. No, he found me. He was searching for me. Like Jesus said, a lost coin, a lost sheep a lost son, a seeking God. And God reveals himself. And so there are evidences of God, yes. There are evidences, I already mentioned them, conscience and creation and, and, and things of that nature. There are evidences, scripture that points to the prophecy of scripture that has been fulfilled, over 300 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus in his ministry on earth. I mean, there are, there are things you can accrue to point to but the Lord has to reveal himself. And so, Job, you don't understand nature. So how, how can you understand the things of God? In verse 19, he says, teach us what we should say to him, for we can prepare nothing because of the darkness. Should he be told that I wish to speak? If a man were to speak, surely he would be swallowed up. So he continues, he says, well, teach us what we should say to him, if you can, but if you can't, explain the natural. What makes you think you can contend with him? When he says in verse 20, should he be told that I wish to speak? If a man were to speak, surely he would be swallowed up. Should I presume to demand an audience with him? As you already have demanded to speak to him. And in verse 21, he says, uh, even now men cannot look at the light when it is bright in the skies. When the wind has passed and cleared them. And so he's saying, you can't even go outside. Afterwards, the wind has, has cleared the, the clouds from the sky at noon. And uh, you, you can't look up at the sky without being blinded by its brilliance. And that's just nature. That's just what the, the nature is. But you don't understand that God is even brighter than that. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16 says it like this. He said, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. He lives, he dwells in unapproachable light. As you remember, Moses spoke to the Lord and said, show me your glory. And God said, no. no. No man can look upon me in my radiant glory and live. The best that I can do is allow you to see the residual presence, my residual presence. And that's when the scripture says that the Lord passed before Moses and began to give his name. Because his name, this is found in Exodus 33 and 34, because his name reveals his glory. So he gave him his name the Lord, the Lord God, and he begins to give his name, his titles to him. And that was where the glory is revealed. And so God dwells in unapproachable light. No man can see him in his full glory. But in Revelation, we're told, but one day we shall see him. We shall dwell with him because we'll have been made perfect and we will be holy and we'll be able to see him and have that kind of face-to-face -face fellowship with our God. Well, he goes on, and he says in verse 22, he comes from the north as golden splendor with God, his awesome majesty. 
So notice this, he comes from the north as gold and splendor. God is portrayed as coming in splendor. Well, it's interesting how it says he comes from the north. This is said because north winds will clear out the clouds and the north winds will give you a clear view. And, um, but he comes, he says, and that reminds me of Jesus' second coming when it says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. And so it is to be, amen. He is coming with the clouds. We shall see him. Now it's interesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little more here in verse 22 when it says he comes from the north. Why is that significant? That is, is significant because that is a, a symbol. The north is a symbol of God's throne room. Um, how do we know that? Well, in Isaiah 14, verse 13, uh, Lucifer is being spoken to. And in Isaiah 14, 13, this is what it reads. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. North was used as a picture of God's throne room. And so when Lucifer said, I will be there on the sides of the north, that's another way for us to understand that he was saying, I'm going to usurp God's authority and I will be worshipped as God. He says in verse 23, as for the Almighty, we cannot find him. He's excellent in power, in judgment, and abundant justice. He does not oppress, therefore men fear him. He shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. And so we'll close with these two verses. Elihu says, God is awesome, Job. And his glory, in his glory, he's unapproachable. That's why we need him revealed to us. In John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, the one and only son, the one who is at the father's side, he has revealed him. That's why we need a mediator because he has what is called incomprehensible power and he is just. And at the same time, he doesn't crush people simply because he feels like it or even sometimes should. When it says in verse 24, and we'll close with this verse, therefore men fear him. He shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. Men should fear him because of his incredible power and majesty. And those who consider themselves wise in their own eyes, he will remain a mystery. Is that for me? <laughs> That's the Lord. He's saying it's time to stop, son. Okay. Those who consider themselves wise in their own eyes, to them, he remains a mystery. I'll close with a couple of scriptures. Wise in their own eyes. Isaiah 5.21 Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Proverbs 3, 7. Now, most of us have heard Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will what? He will direct your paths, right? But it goes on to say, be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not wise. I, I memorized a lot of scripture in King James. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so when he's speaking here, therefore men fear him, he shows no partiality to any who are wise of heart. He's simply saying those who are wise in their own eyes have no need for God because they already consider themselves wise. And that's why 1 Corinthians 3.18, we'll close with that, says, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Why? Because the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of man. Because the weakness of God is greater than the power of man. And the whole point that Paul was making in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is so that no flesh, chapter 1 through 3, is so no flesh would glory in his sight. And so 
If we think that we, by searching, can find them out completely, we've already seen in the book of Job, it doesn't work. So Eliud was simply saying in closing by saying, Job, don't be so wise in your own eyes. Don't be so proud and arrogant. That was his closing words. This is the one who has said, listen to me and I'll teach you something. But you know, that's true. What is the key to greatness in the kingdom of God? Humility. What is the sin that brought Satan out of heaven? Pride. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. Father, we ask that you would work within us even now. Lord, we want to know you deeper and better. And as we've gone through these sophisticated and very deep arguments, Lord, so much of it I still don't understand. But the bit that I do, Lord, causes me to desire to know more. As we're almost at the conclusion of this study, Lord, where you, Lord, begin to speak, and you tell, you tell Job, you tell him to become like a man, quit yourself like a man, get ready to answer me. You've been asking me questions for all these chapters. I'm going to ask you a few myself. And at that point, Lord, we have an opportunity to see some things that will help us to understand the entire context of this book. And so, Lord, I ask that we, your children, Lord, that we would have humility and would realize that, Lord, unless you reveal yourself to us, there's really no way we would, by searching, find you. So thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the prophets who spoke concerning the one to come. Thank you for the scriptures that we have to guide us and inform us. And thank you for Jesus, who is the word of God made flesh, who dwelt amongst us. And Lord, I ask that we, the church, that we would, we would rely on you and know you. Father, may we not be wise in our own eyes. Father, we ask that you, but supply that which we need so that we might have relationship with you and you have through Christ and we thank you for that. And even as our eyes remain closed for just a moment, there may be some right now watching online or perhaps here in this room. We need to get right with the Lord and you need prayer and you know that you, knew, you, you need to and you know that. And as our eyes are closed, I want to pray for you. And if you can honestly say, God, I, I need you. I need to know you. I need to know of you, Lord. Help me, forgive me. If you need prayer right now, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Just raise your hand. Father, you see these hands. Lord, you know the reason why they're being raised to you. And in Jesus' name, Lord, I just ask that you would reach down and every individual, every thought, every need, everything that is necessary, Lord, you have already supplied through Jesus, but I ask that you would make them to know that. May your Holy Spirit work right now. As our hearts are open to you to receive from you, I pray that you would fill with your Holy Spirit, everyone whose hearts are open to you now. We will follow you, and we thank you, Lord, for washing us. We confess our need. We confess our sins. We forsake, and we ask, Lord, to wash us and fill us with your presence. And may we be your witnesses from now on. And we receive that, Lord, and thank you by faith. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us to your glory, in your name. Amen.